So we're back for part two for this 2003 Chevy Suburban. The actual for the fuel alcohol content sensor issues, parasitic draw and mass airflow issues. Part one, we identified the fuel alcohol content sensor issues. So we had a couple of broken wires, one that was specifically for the fuel alcohol content sense, sensor power. We soldered and spliced them in, shrunk, shrink tube it and rewrapped it up with tape. We're putting it all back together now. Uh, we're gonna look at the scan tool data, clear out the you know codes, the reset the field trim counters, and make sure everything is good to go. We can take it for a drivability test, look at mass airflow readings. We clean the mass airflow uh, since we're in there anyways, and then we'll get dressed that and see where our parasitic draw is. All right, so we cleared the codes, reset the field trim. Fuel alcohol contents 11%. It's going to continue to go down. When I first started, when I first looked at this, it was like 30% with the 17. Now it's 11. Going down. Now it's 10. 51 hertz. Fuel temp 57 degrees. So it's going to continue to uh, actually read it and calculate correctly because we just fixed it. Those wires. So we're going to let it continue to run. Get that. We're going to do drivability checks to make sure that's still good along with the mass airflow and graph, graph that. This thing had a very weak crank time. Uh, so we're gonna have to, after we do those tests, and verify the fuel composition sensor is good. And the mass airflow, we're gonna have to go back and address that draw for that fuse that we found in the part one of this video. Continuing the run for a few more minutes. Now it's down to 2%. Fuel alcohol content, so. Good there. Let's just put this to Imperial units to check our, our metric to check our mass airflow. 5.7 grams per second. So let it idle down. But fuel alcohol content's good now. I'm going to go take it for a test drive and look at our mass airflow and graph it. So it's been running for about 15 20 minutes now at idle. And if you look, our fuel trims, short and long trim, are perfect. Plus or minus one, they are perfect. The alcohol content is two percent, frequency is fifty-one, so all that's that part is fixed. Now what we got to look at is our mass airflow should be around five point three grams per second. We're a little low, right? But if you remember from part one, we had a low frequency code for the mass airflow at like eleven, twelve hundred RPMs. So we're gonna go ahead and graph that while we um, drive down the road that RPM range and see if we can see if it drops out or not. If it does, we know it needs a new mass airflow. I mean, we need one anyways because it is under reporting. Um, it seems to be under reporting a little bit, so we'll address that. I'm gonna take it for a drive right now, and then we'll come back and do our parasitic draw. All right, so sorry about the glare, but uh, so we're in new truck, 4.7 grams per second. If I put this thing in drive, we're at, you just gotta load on it, 5.8. Source and specifications there. Fuel trim's perfect still. Fuel alcohol content's perfect. What I want to do is I'm graphing the frequency because the call we had said it, when it had low frequency, which means it drops out at you know below 1200 hertz. And it's around 11 or 1200 RPMs. I'm not saying that's what's happening. We're going to drive it and take a look at it and then go from there. So we're driving and uh, sorry about the, it's really bad glare, but we have nothing dropping out at all here slow down and get on it again you angle that down more there you go that's set now go up more yeah so there's nothing for uh nothing dropping out anyway so yeah so yeah, nothing's dropping out on it. Now that low frequency could have been because of, you know, the fuel alcohol content sensor, but I don't want to just go ahead and throw a mass airflow in it um, because that would be throwing parts at the problem. So uh, we'll do some, we can do some drive, more drivability tests and make sure it pass all its tests. Make sure it's no P0102. And if there isn't, then it passes. Uh, if the current and history codes, uh, then we're good to go. Trying to get some rid of this glare, so I'm gonna slow down. And the bottom line here 
black line in the very bottom is 1200. So if it drops below that, that's when we'd have the low frequency, the P0102 code, which we're not going to have. Everything would be fine because we just did this, but do another test with it. So I'm going to get up on it a little bit. We'll see the RPM ranges. Let off the gas, nothing drops out. So I honestly believe it had something to do with that. Um, fuel trims and all that other stuff being off and so there's nothing wrong with this mass airflow but we'll prove that with the other codes like I said make sure there's no thrown codes or none of that yeah perfect sorry about all that glare but now we're going to read codes no codes at all so we did a drivability check so that mass airflow is good now we got to go address the actual parasitic draw and go from there Another thing we're going to address on this before we go back to the shop to do the draw test is the four-wheel drive, it had a history code in the past where it for the encoder circuit. So we're in two-wheel drive, we put in auto, it works. But if I put in four-wheel drive here to push it, right, nothing even happens. And then it says service four-wheel drive. Well, if I go back, and there was no trouble codes, but if I rerun diagnostics, to the ATC automatic transfer case. There's a fault in the ATC, and it's a C0327 encoder circuit malfunction, current diagnostic trouble code. What that means is there's a uh, actual uh, circuit in there with zero to five volts. So the five volt, zero to five volts, it has an encoder ring, and it reads, reads different resistance, which is different voltage, and that tells you if you're in auto too high four high or four low so what you can look at is the actual live data for the atc <clears throat> that pulls up here transfer case so you can look at some data push four high that actually went in that time but when you're pushing that you can look at some live data um see the mode switch return voltage i'm pushing the mode switch Goes to four high. Coded gear position says four high right there. Go back to two high. And it has an asterisk. But there's definitely something going on with that encoder. So we'd have to check we're gonna have to check the encoder. Um I don't know if I'll film that part or not. They're actually pretty easy to troubleshoot. So we're gonna go back to the shop and uh do the parasitic draw test all right so now we're doing the parasitic draw test again we got 1.13 amps in series to the battery negative on the battery negative positive going in i got a t-pin just wedge in there because it's some corrosion but it just dropped down so modules are shutting off we're gonna let this sit for 30 minutes an hour come back and see where we're at for our draw and go from there because right now we're at 200 milliamps which is 0.2 of an amp so this parasitic draw has been, we had this meter on here for the last hour and a half, maybe approaching two hours now. We've been watching it with an external camera and it's still point, it went down a little bit, it's 0.19, which is 190 milliamps and service data for this Chevy should be no more than 25 milliamps. So when I pull this fuse here, which is the... Uh, IPC DIC right there instrument panel cluster if I pull this fuse right there watch it goes down to 10 milliamps so we need to check that circuit out and pull up the schematics and start troubleshooting that parasitic draw on the instrument panel cluster so 180 milliamps, like I said, no more than 25 milliamps. So I think what we're going to do to actually troubleshoot this is I got the diagram pulled up for the data link communications class two network. So I believe it's zero to seven, seven three quarter volt square wave DC. We're going to get to the splice point connector, pull the comb out, plug all the little harness in. I've done another video and I'll show you on camera here. 
and we're going to see when everything turns off we shouldn't have any talking on the module we should have zero volts or on the bus i mean if we have you know something talking which we expect the ipc to be talking then we'll unplug it you know find out why it's talking or if it's not talking we'll go from that way but i think that's a good starting point to troubleshoot this parasitic draw and see why our ipc is what's going on with it you know it may be is it talking on the network when it shouldn't be or is there an actual you know something else shorten the voltage or short the ground or something like that so we'll uh, hook up the scope and go on from there all right for this parasitic draw what we're going to do now is we have the batteries or the battery hooked up want to make sure there's no lights on in the dash which there's not we have a little red light flashing on the radio there so you get that's for memory that's expected but when we pull the fuse that's when we drop from 190 180 milliamps to 7 10 20 milliamps which is within the specifications 25 to 30. so we know it's the ipc instrument cluster so what i want to do now is i want to look at the class 2 data so this wiring diagram uh it's without the where is it it's without as8 rpo code so IPC fuse, this is the one we pull, and the uh, draw goes away. This is hot at all times, powers it up, goes through here, and then goes to your ground. Well, this is your class two data pin A6, where all this data meets is on a splice pack 205, pin A6, instrument panel cluster. This is your little splice pack or comb, they call it. I wanna get to that, unplug all these modules and do some tests. So if I unplug them all, because all these modules are talking, I want to make sure basically another module is not talking to the instrument cluster telling it to turn on. So if I disconnect that, I take the network out of the equation. If I still have a draw, then that tells me uh, it's not another module turning on. And then we can plug them back in with our breakout leads that I got from AES Wave. I'm sure these guys right here, we may or may not use these. And that'll determine, you know, if that module's alive which it is, if it's talking or what's going on, then we can tr troubleshoot it down that way. So where's this splice pack located at? It's actually this guy right here, index three, which my assistant, my lovely assistant, you gotta give him, I just locked the door, you unlock it. If I open this up, we took some brackets out of the way and panels. And the splice pack. Right, trying to get my hands in here. You get the light up more. Right there, perfect. That's the splice pack. We take that white cover off, and that'll isolate the network. That's where all these modules meet in there, and they all communicate on the one single wire LAN class two. It's like zero to seven and a half, seven and three, seven and three quarter volt square wave. We got some, I got another video on that, how you can troubleshoot a GM class two data network issue. We don't have a data network issue. We're just using some data to troubleshoot it, but we have access to the instrument cluster, all that stuff pulled off. So we're going to go ahead and pull that white comb out and then uh, see if our draw stays or goes away and then troubleshoot and go from there. All right. So we got the comb out So all these pins are connected. They bring all these modules together. Well, if you look in here, we popped it out of there. We basically, none of these modules would communicate now. To, well, they'll communicate, but not to each other. Come in more to light. See that right there? Each one of those wires, pins, goes to a certain a network, like I, or a module, instrument cluster, transmission control module, body control module, so forth. So with that unplugged, if I do the parasitic draw now, well, if it stays, then it's not, that means another module is not telling the IPC to turn on. If it goes away, that could be the case. We're going to do that parasitic draw next with the door closed and then see what our results are. All right. So we got that comb out of there. So the network, all the modules are still talking, but they're not talking to each other. They're all off this network. We still have 200 milliamps, 0.2 of an amp, 200 milliamps. 
way excessive. We get 180 to 200 milliamps. My assistant, Steve-O, smile for the camera, is going to pull that fuse when I tell him, pull it. Then we get 10 milliamps, put it back in. We get 200 milliamps. So what does that tell us? That tells us another module such as the BCM or PCM or there's more to this picture with the schematics because it's the dotted line. Um, that's telling us that these other modules are not telling the instrument cluster to turn on, which is basically more facts that the instrument cluster is actually indeed bad. We can put a new instrument cluster in it, program it with the J-Box to get the odometer correctly and everything and be done with that. But we could go farther and see what's going on in the instrument cluster, which is going to take a lot of troubleshooting time. But now what I want to do is uh, do some more network checks, and then we'll go from there. So before we do some more tests, here's the rest of the splice pack. 205, your radio, PCM, body control module, and so forth. So essentially, right now, the way the vehicle sits, instrument cluster is getting power and grounds, and we hook it up. So it's getting power and grounds, but we're isolating this off the bus. All of these modules are off of the bus. So that means they're not this, imagine this disconnected here. They're all disconnected. That means a body control module, for example, or a PCM cannot be talking to this module, telling it to turn on because everything is off of the bus. All right, so before we do some more network test, what I did is I went and unplug the instrument cluster, one connector, which is this connector here. We may need all this pinout data here eventually. And with the fuse in, powered up, I get 0 .000, right? Well, if I had it on the milliamp scale, I'm basically getting like, you know, seven milliamps. So that is 100% our draw is the instrument cluster causing our parasitic draw. So what I want to do now is I want to hook up the oscilloscope, plug this, plug the instrument cluster back in, hook up the scope, watch this data, just for curiosity's sake, to see if it's talking by itself, sending a signal out. Um, but what we're going to have to do is start ripping the instrument cluster apart and checking inside the circuit. It's a bad instrument cluster. What you would do is you get a new one, you buy one, you put it in, you program it, and this parasitic draw is gone. But we want to take a, a step farther and continue to troubleshoot. All right, so we got the battery hooked back up, fused in. So what I want to show you here is on Splice Pack 205, if we go to pin B, which is a dark green wire, which is the PCM, my assistant will come over here. I have this probed into pin B there. And I'm getting this, and I'm going to my oscilloscope, positive lead to that, negative lead. I'm just using my breakout box because pin four and five is the ground on the DLC. And if you look, shut the door here. I got key on engine off. You see these traces? It sends one, and then it sends one, and then it sends one. What that's doing. It's waiting for a response. That's sending signals out, waiting for a response from other modules, right? These are your zeros and ones in here when you're talking. That's your zeros and ones. I mean, you could put a trigger in there and you can do all that stuff, but uh, that's your zeros and ones waiting for a, re a message response. You get a trigger set up here. Right there. So there, you know, zeros and ones might be like zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, main, mean, turn, fuel injector one on or whatever. But this message basically means that it's waiting for a uh, response from other modules. So that means that mo modules online, right? So if I turn the key off, I turn the key off, it's still talking, right? But it should eventually stop talking. There, it stopped talking. So when you first put your DMM on, you have like an amp, one amp, until this thing stops talking, powers down, and it's not talking no more. 
So now what we're going to do is we're going to do that. We just, the only reason we did that is just to show you how it works. We're going to do it with the instrument cluster one now and see if it's talking or not. doesn't really matter for this. Um, it could give us some clues. We just know the instrument cluster is bad, right? But more data is always helpful. So battery hooked back up, fused in for the IPC. Key on engine off. We're hooked up to the pin G, which is the gray wire, which is the instrument cluster panel. Right to this guy, the class two data. And um, you can see we have, we don't have those traces. We have a little bit of trace there, but not much. So if I turn the key off, see how it kind of dropped down there? You can hear the locks doing all kinds of weird things. It's because it's not communicating with everything because we don't have this comb plugged in. But you can see it dropped down a little bit. And then my assistant's gonna get off the cell phone and actually pull that fuse. You're on camera. Okay. okay. I'm sending my video to my dad. Okay. Your video. Okay, you might just pull the fuse. Sorry about that, guys. He gets real sidetracked. Not quite yet. Go ahead and pull the fuse for the IPC. Plug it back in, pull it, and plug it back in. So you can see in the video, we got a little bit of anomaly there. Not a, so it's telling me it's not, a, it's not completely um, obviously talking, which it's not, but maybe perhaps a little bit. Actually, I don't think it really is because you would have your full waveform of zero to seven and a half seven three quarter volts what that tells me is it's not talking but there's obviously a power something in the instrument cluster that's causing this thing to draw whether it's a mosfet a diode or something that's going bad so now we can try to troubleshoot that i know putting a new cluster in it programming it would fix the issue but we want to continue to go farther and if i put this at a smaller scale That's just, I think a lot of that's just noise, honestly, from, yeah, we're getting 0.4, 400 millivolts steady. I think that's a lot of noise from this thing being on uh, when it's drawn amperage when it should not be. So we can even do a smaller time base. <coughs> so we're going to go ahead <coughs> and troubleshoot some more. So one other thing I want to talk about just for future is you could hypothetically, if you had a class two data bus issue, and I did it in another video, you could plug all these into that uh, uh, splice pack connector. And then if you had a, you know, uh, class two data was stuck high or stuck low, um, you could pull one at a time. And then, so you pulled like the fifth one and it happened to be, I don't know, the, just pick one like the body control module you pull that like the fifth you know fourth or fifth one and it goes back to normal then that's the module or network that you would need to go look at so i do that in another video on a old six denali where i had a bad ground engine block ground um for some for the pcm and the battery or generator control module uh that's not the issue with this just another reason you can use that uh breakout lead from as wave so now what we can do is we're gonna pull the cluster and what we can do is, I got the pin out data. This is the one connector that goes in there. It shows what every pin does, like mill control, mill function indicator light control, not used, the wash, low wash, vehicle speed, engine speed come from the PCM, which we can always eliminate these circuits because it's not getting that from the PCM because the PCM is not talking and we prove that with pulling that uh, splice pack out. And I have that diagram in here. So like vehicle speed or engine speed, A5, circuit 121, A5, 121. Again, A5, 121 to the instrument cluster, it's getting a signal from the PCM a5 121 
but that's not talking to this so we already eliminated that for the bus data um so we know that's not causing that so what we want to look at then is we can go through these pins but you're going to have you know your power and grounds going to this module and if we were to hook up a dmm in series or an amp clamp around the wires you can i would expect your 180 190 200 milliamps of voltage going through the power and the ground wires we could do that but that's not going to really help us too much because we already know that's the issue we have to basically rip this thing apart check it on the vehicle or take it to a power supply on a bench hook it up to power and grounds and then see what circuit is uh being turned on just power the one side of the circuit and what i mean by that is all these diagrams here so this one right here give this power all the time give this ground on a power supply or in a vehicle this side is when you turn the key on and that's for your in the, your uh, lamp but in for its ground we don't really care about that right now and i mean it could be an issue but give this power give this ground constantly and see where inside of the circuitry or this logic circuit inside the instrument cluster if it's a bad mosfet bad transistor bad diode or so forth um this is when you turn it can so we're not going to do that part so we'll get a plan together and troubleshoot and go from there all right so it needs a new instrument cluster like i said we could pull it apart troubleshoot it but um see if it's a bad transistor mosfet uh diode right but that would take several hours so and we can get a new cluster pre-programmed um for couple hundred bucks 220 or something like that 230 i can remember but uh pre-programmed you just got to give them the, the van the mileage and the hours if it has an hour meter and then um if you didn't if you can't get a pre-programmed you can you know obviously buy a new one as well and uh from chevy and use a pass-through j box to program it but they basically take these old ones they rebuild them because this one the oil pressure sensor is pegged out to 80 so that's not working right but if you go into the instrument cluster you go to active test you go to ipc gauge you can do the gauge sweep test so basically i'll hit the on button here i'm going to turn that on you watch the gauges they go all the way to the right i go off they go all the way off i go escape but the oil pressure gauge stays to the right so that'll fix that issue the oil gauge and the draw and we'll get that put in make sure there's no parasitic draw afterwards we'll show that on camera and then the other thing with this vehicle is it's got a it's got a rough idle not i guess rough it wants to like it'll idle and then it kind of idles down excessively so typically what that is on these is a dirty throttle body so we got to clean the throttle body and you know do a relearn procedure on it is that carbon in the throttle body when you have your ac clutch on your defrost which uses your ac clutch right mm. under control and all that is used by the throttle body motor it's electronic it needs to compensate for that so typically a dirty throttle body will cause that and that's pretty easy to fix but to prove that it's dropping down we'll get some data pulled up here before my scan tool dies We'll go to zero to 600, zero to 600, so we're on the same graph and we're gonna merge these graphs together. And we're gonna watch this. So straight line green, 550 is what it wants and the blue is what it's at. So it's pretty accurate right now, but it'll eventually kind of idle down. Not too bad there. Still pretty good. See if it does it again. Earlier it was dropping way down to like 400, 350. It was dropping way down and it would cut, catch itself back up. And that's all because of a dirty throttle body. Very common on these Chevys. There it did right there. You could hear it dropped way down to like 350 or so. So when we clean that, we'll redo these tests and that'll fix that part of the vehicle.
So right now I turned the defrost off, which is not using the AC clutch. Um, and it's a lot better, but when the clutch is cycling on and off, it does have that load, which is why we need to clean that throttle body and do the relearn procedure, and that'll fix that. Now the other issue that it had a code for a blend door, um, which I don't know if I'll address in this video or another video, but they'll be driving and it'll be, you have your AC on, or I remember if they said the AC on or the heat on, but basically it'll be driving and the AC's on and then it goes warm or vice versa. I believe they said it was cold and then it went warm randomly. They'd restart the vehicle, it'd reset. So if you go to the body con or the heat and air heating and air conditioning module, there's no codes now. There was a body code earlier when we first got this vehicle a couple of days ago. But what, what I would look for to address this, because it is intermittent, is we're going to go to live data. We're going to go to our door positions. Um, I probably won't troubleshoot in this video series, but we're going to go to left door actual, left door command, right door actual, and command. So right now, the left command it wants 0 to 255 counts it's a hexadecimal number so it wants 80 counts it's actual at 80 it wants right it wants 156 it's at 156 158 it's got to be within a certain amount of counts I can't remember exactly what it is if it's 5 10 or or percentage of what it needs to be within if it's not it'll throw that code and it may default back to its uh, home position and it's a 0 to 5 volt uh, sensor they use there's positive negative and the motor going to it and there's the reverse the player to go the other way and the other three wires is your potentiometer sensor so if i move these all the way down to cold right they're going to be opposite of each other but the left command is 186 it's actual is 186 right command is 58 actual is 54. so we'd have to you know go through and troubleshoot this probably not can do in this video series but um i don't know if i actually have a video on this or not on another on another vehicle but and I just moved it there again, so it did change. Something we can look at uh, to troubleshoot on this vehicle as well. But moving forward, what we need to do now is get a new instrument cluster. Um, we can look at the blend door stuff for that circuit, clean the throttle body, do that, read learn procedure. It needs a new four wheel drive actuator, motor with the encoder ring because it would intermittently go out, service the four wheel drive and all that. That's another zero to five volt reference. So we'll fix that as well. Get this vehicle all back to normal operating conditions. All right, so that cold that's in here from before was the B0408 temperature control circuit one malfunction. So basically it's, it's a servo motor, right? We got to troubleshoot that. I may actually add it to this video. Depends on what we find on it. So once we get this other stuff fixed, so we'll uh, go from there. Alrighty, so we clean the throttle body. Everything's relearned on it. We got the AC on, so the clutch is cycling on and off. And if you look, how much green is what it wants, 550. Blue is for 550 around there roughly. Look how much closer it's together now. It's not dropping off like it did because of that uh, carbon in the throttle body. So we cleaned that out. That was why the engine was surging. Significantly better, so that fixes that. Got to get the new instrument cluster put in. We got to get the new four wheel drive actuator motor, the encoder ring put in, and then address that blend door for the temperature control circuit one. And then uh, this vehicle is all good to go. So that'll probably be it for this part two. Uh, we'll make a part three, it'll probably be a separate video from this one. All right, so I wanted to add something. This isn't the vehicle we've been working on. This is a 2004 Suburban, my buddies. It's the same exact thing, same instrument cluster, just a year newer, right? Same instrument cluster. Everything's off, we're doing a parasitic draw test and uh, doing the same exact test. And if you look, we got 0 0.02 amps, which is 20 milliamps, 20 to 30 milliamps. So yeah, 20 milliamps right there because it went to three a little bit so we had 30 but it's settling down at 20 milliamps so that is perfect we know that it's just another reference point so obviously the other one needs a new instrument cluster which we will get for this guy 
right here. Uh, I know I keep saying I'm going to end this part two video, but that's it for part two now until we uh, get the parts in and go from there. Well, I lied to you. I keep saying I'm going to end it. So, looking at the L4 again, I pulled the fuse out for the IPC on this one. And obviously, it's still 0 .0, 0 0.02 milliamps. Sorry, that's my son calling again. So, pulled the fuse off for the IPC. Still 0 0.02 milliamps, which is 20 milliamps. So, that proves that this uh, vehicle that we're working on here has the issue with the instrument cluster. So, that'll be it. I promise this time until we get part. I know I keep saying I'm done with part two, but I did take the instrument cluster apart. Uh, apart. I hooked up to a DC power supply. I used my uh, pinout data. B11 is power, B12 is ground. That's off of this, B11 power, B12 ground, just like when it's in the car. And I'm pinned off the back of the instrument cluster. And I got all apart. And I got, you know, battery voltage roughly in there. But you can see we're drawing. I got full current. Or not full current. It's whatever current's going to draw from the instrument cluster. And it's drawn around 190, 180 milliamps. So, and I've sat here for, well, 20, 30 minutes. And it doesn't, it doesn't ever go down. So, and these are supposed to draw barely any current at all right obviously so what we could do now is you can start probing through the circuit see if one of these mosfets in here transistor diode so something's going on with it right that would take a lot of time to probably find so we're going to get a new instrument cluster but i know you could actually go through that and figure that out so we'll get the new cluster coming in and we'll get it all back together and follow up with part three and show the uh you know only 20 to 30 milliamps max draw when it's all fixed all right so i said i'm done but i did some more research and kept looking at this board and what happens on these you use lead solder back in the day it sounds like and they get what they call silver migration and the silver migration little black spots and it becomes conductive so there's, there was a big blob right here and i kind of moved it around um so you can see all that stuff there it becomes conductive on other circuits right so i need to take some alcohol and clean all this up clean all the circuits up rerun the test and see if it's good to go probably never going to believe me i keep saying i'm done but i did do some more cleaning so i'm going to get this thing fixed i cleaned the back of the board up with all that corrosion that was transferring electrons from one circuit to the other i'll add a picture to this video where i zoomed in what the circuit was causing it um, I'll probably do a little more cleaning, put it all back together, but I did hook up with another wire here. Um, plug this one in here. Doesn't matter for what we're doing, it just shows that the board works. Is the other wire from your ignition switch coming in is what I have pinned out. So I'm going to turn it on and you'll see the board light up. Do a self check. You know, just prove all your LEDs and all that stuff works, right? So, but if I unplug that blue wire, it's just like turning the key off. And you see right now we're drawing 500 milliamps. See, lights go off. We're still drawing 450, 475 milliamps. After 20 some seconds, that should go down to zero amps. Before it did a, you know, 180, 190, 200 milliamps. But you're going down to zero or, you know, barely any milliamps, one or two maybe. Takes a little bit of time. And that way everything, there it is, shut off. If everything's good, it's shut off. No more amp draw. I mean, it's micro. You can't really tell, maybe an amp or two, but that's well within the specifications. We still got our battery voltage. So that's good. Um, if I unplug the power, or if I turn it off, turn it back on. Just like we did before. So you go up to your regular, you know, 450, 500, and then it'll take 20 some seconds. It'll power down. Now it's working now because I cleaned all that stuff off the back of the board with transferring electrons. So I'll clean it some more. We'll put it all back together. 
Make sure this thing shuts off again. It's like 20, 30 seconds it takes. Boom, shut off. So no more draw. That is our parasitic draw. That's killing the battery after two or three days. So like I said, I'll clean it some more. I'll put it all back together. I put tape on there to line everything up for all the uh, indications there. And then we'll put it back in. And uh, it still has an oil pressure gauge issue, but you can replace those servo motors. You can buy these motors, but we could address that another time. Just desolder them and solder them in. But yeah, no amp draw. So that's good. That's a good find. It beats buying a new cluster for 220, 230 bucks when it just needs to be cleaned up. So I say that's it for this video. Um, hopefully it is, but who knows if I continue to find more stuff. But I'll try to include everything else in part three. So we're still having issues with this instrument cluster. This is my DC power supply, which I'm going to show in the next few clips. Um, we're still having issues with the instrument cluster. Sometimes it powers up, sometimes it powers down, but recently it hasn't been powering down. So there's something else going on there, which I'm going to show you in these next few clips, but we're going to go ahead and get a new instrument cluster coming because um, there's something else on the circuit board that's causing that not to power down completely. All right, so we fixed the instrument cluster. Everything's good with that. The uh, oil pressure gauge there, there's nothing wrong with that. We tested that. It's actually the probably the wiring or actually the sending unit, so we have to address that. Um, but that cluster's good. Eventually, we're going to get some light bulbs over from Amazon, replace some uh, bad light bulbs in there. But we fixed that uh, back of the board for that corrosion. Got a DMM hooked up. Going to go ahead and hook it up to battery... Negative in series to the positive, or battery negative to the battery, and then in series to the cable. So right there at 1.3 amps when everything's turned on. And then we'll let it power down here. It's going down, this should go to zero. It's 50 milliamps, 30, zero. So now we're good. No more parasitic draw. So that's a fix for this vehicle. So now what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and replace that four-wheel drive actuator motor. So we're having some issues with this uh, instrument cluster. Um, this instrument cluster here is a good one off of a 04 Suburban. Um, exactly the same thing for the 03 Suburban, so that's the good one. I got power and ground going into it. I have my amp clamp around it. I have my scope on, so right now it's not reading amperage. My assistant, when I tell him he's going to put battery negative on, go ahead and hook it up. You can hear it, the motor on it, the servo motors. We're reading 410 milliamps, a flat line, 408 milliamps. 40 it'll drop down here and it should go to under 20 or 30 milliamps keep watching it sorry about the glare there's 437 now remember this is a good one it's going drop down to 13 milliamps right but notice that flat line so now what we're going to do is do the bad one so we're well under our 25 to 30 milliamps good flat line with our amp clamp so now what we're going to do is we're going to use check the bad one. All right, before we hook this one up, we got the bad one, same configuration. We got zero right there. So my assistant, when I tell him to hook it up, go ahead and hook it up. And look at that square wave and all that hash and noise. 185, 190 milliamps. But it never shuts off. It stays like this. Well, forever and never ever shuts off. We're around 180, 190 milliamps. And that's why we have a draw on this 2003 Chevy Suburban. Um, there was some corrosion on the back of the circuit board. We cleaned that up. But we still have a draw with this instrument cluster. So it needs a new instrument cluster.
but there's something going on. It's like it's on and off signal. So I'm using a DC power supply again for this instrument cluster for the old three Chevy Suburban. But what I found interesting is let me set my voltage to let's go like almost 15 volts, like 14, you know, alternator running, for example. I got positive negative powering it up. The blue trace would be ignition voltage if I need to do that. Let me go ahead and plug that in. So positive negative, I got max current or token draw whatever current it needs. I turn it on. 14 volts, 400 milliamps, and then it goes up to 450, and then it's gonna drop back down after 20 some seconds. Time out here, and it should go to sleep mode. So it goes way up in amperage, four or 500, not way up, but and look, it dropped down, and it stays asleep now. So you know, if I hook up the ignition to it, the blue tracer, same thing, you know, lights are on, but if I take the ignition off, I can turn the key off on the engine, lights go off, it's going to time out, you know, from 450, 500 millivolts, actually like 4, 450, 475, and then it'll shut itself off and go back to sleep at the 14 volts over here. Here's your millivolts over here. Shuts off. But what I found out is, watch this. Turn this off. Unplug this. Let's turn it on and let's just set our voltage to, instead of the 14, let's go to right here, which is 12 volts. Right? That's about 12, you know, 12.6 for a car battery. Turn this back off. Plug the red in. So I'm powering ground to the module. Let's turn it on. Look, it goes to your 200 milliamps, or 180, 190, 200, and it never, ever shuts off from there. It stays there. It never shuts off unless, I don't know if I'll do it, but I'll take the voltage up. I took the voltage up a little bit, and you can hear it turn on, and then it'll shut off. When it's above that 12 volts. So it's not waking up fully. And it's not going to sleep fully or something. That's what it seems like. Got a new instrument cluster coming on the way anyways, but just wanted to show you this on video. I found it pretty interesting. You're going to shut off. So just some more data.